Bankless Nation, welcome to a conversation with Anatoly Yakovenko. Recently, Solana seems to have turned a page in its evolution with the Jito airdrop putting $200 million in the hands of over 10,000 different addresses. It seems to have really reawakened a part of Solana as new addresses and new TVL have come online and new conversations are being had in Solana, mainly conversations around Solana governance and Solana economics. And so this has captured the attention of many uh, across the crypto industry and including my own. And so I decided just to throw Anatoly a Riverside link where we record podcasts here at Bankless and ask him to come on and just chat about things. This was a pretty unscripted conversation. Usually we have pretty thorough, robust agendas for uh, 95% of all Bankless podcasts, but this is not one of them. This is just David and Anatoly vibing on a podcast together, talking about Solana, talking about Ethereum, talking, talking about tribal stuff, but not with a tribal tone. So I hope you enjoy that. Before getting to the conversation with Anatoly Yakovenko, first, a moment to talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible. Whether you're in the Ethereum tribe, you're in the Solana tribe, or you're in the Bitcoin tribe, use Kraken to get to whatever preferred destination chain of your choosing. Kraken is our preferred exchange for crypto in 2023. And if you do not have an account with Kraken, consider clicking the links in the show notes to getting started with Kraken today. Kraken knows crypto. Kraken's been in the crypto game for over a decade, and as one of the largest and most trusted exchanges in the industry, Kraken is on the journey with all of us to see what crypto can be. Human history is a story of progress. It's part of us, hardwired. We're designed to seek change everywhere, to improve, to strive. And if anything can be improved, why not finance? Crypto is a financial system designed with the modern world in mind. Instant permissionless and 24 seven. It's not perfect and nothing ever will be perfect, but crypto is a world changing technology at a time when the world needs it the most. That's the Kraken mission to accelerate the global adoption of cryptocurrency so that you and the rest of the world can achieve financial freedom and inclusion. Head on over to kraken.com slash bankless to see what crypto can be. Not investment advice, crypto trading involves risk of loss. Cryptocurrency services are provided to US and US territory customers by Payward Ventures Inc. PVI doing business as Kraken. Introducing USDV, a better type of stablecoin. Currently billions of dollars in stablecoin yield each year are paid to Tether, Circle, and other central issuers of major stablecoins. But what if yield could be shared with the protocols that use it? Those protocols, in turn, can decide how to reward their users. USDV shares its yield with a community of apps and developers that mint it. Every USDV is backed one-to-one -one by US Treasury bills which pay yield. This yield flows out to the community of USDV issuers, so your protocol or app can get paid for helping end users convert other stables into USDV. This works thanks to a breakthrough technology called Color Trace from Layer Zero. Without it, it was impossible to attribute users of a token with a specific issuer, but now we can. USDV is live on Ethereum, Optimism, Arbitrum, and other chains, and it's already available on over 20 exchanges such as Curve, BitGet, Velodrome, and Stargate. Start participating in the yield from treasury-backed stablecoins at bankless.com slash USDV. Are you launching a token? Is it already live? How are you managing the legal and tax for providing token awards for your team? Toku simplifies everything about managing token grant compensation, and you can get started with them for free. You'll have access to top-notch legal and tax support to handle the distribution and management of tokens for your team. Toku caters to every step in the process, from user-friendly legal templates for granting tokens to tracking vesting periods and calculating withholding taxes. Toku understands every grant structure, token purchase agreements, restricted token awards, restricted token units, token options, and all the other ones. Toku is already simplifying this today for leading companies like Protocol Labs, DYDX Foundation, Mina Foundation, and many more. You can learn more about how Toku can help you streamline your token management and get started for free. Visit Toku at toku.com slash bankless or click the link in the description below. What's up, Anatoly? How's it going? It's, it's good, man. Good to be here. So Solana seems to be going well. Yeah, knock on wood. Um, it's as surprising to me as to anyone else, <laughs> like looking back over the year, well, like looking back over the year, I was like, oh man, okay, this is what, this is what it's going to look like to fail. <laughs> I was like psychologically preparing myself, like at the start of this year, like that things were not going to work out, but why is that? I mean, the, the FTX crash kind of the, the sentiment was really, really negatively turned and there was a lot of risk. To right, I kind of forgot that that was how this year started. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like, and, and, you know, uh, it was, it was like kind of like one, 
no one like left like mm-hmm. um in terms of like internally all the core engineers were like okay whatever i'm coding the problems are still like my i, I still have to finish this <laughs> my job so that mm-hmm. was good and for the vast majority of the companies in the ecosystem you know they got that like fight or flight response and most of them chose fight and like just build better products um but that takes like a while to go from shock to like okay people are actually building stuff um mm-hmm. yeah it, it was like yeah knock on wood man i'm i don't know i don't know <laughs> i don't know how this happened <laughs> okay we, we are like um 13 months past the actual you know ftx incident call us like 12 months past you know being able to actually process what that meant for the crypto industry and especially for solana because solana had to especially process what that would mean for solana and like we could we could go through the gamut of the last 12 months and be like okay well then there was this phase and then there was that phase and then there was this phase but maybe we could just like compress it all into just like what is now the net effect of all of that upon the solana ecosystem because like you said you had some people who just like doubled down some people did leave uh, some people doubled down so like if rather than just like going through the whole like speed running of the 2023 history of solana just like what's the net effect of it the the doubling down like it causes like the people with less conviction to leave and people with more conviction to double down and that is the best thing that could happen to an ecosystem. If you can survive it, what had happened, what like the result was that you had a really core, super connected, strong group of people that had really deep convictions that just built the whole year. They just saw it as an opportunity. Now I have more space, right? Like there's fewer noise, fewer competitors in my product category. Like it actually is like turned out to be like <laughs> a huge win. Like, I don't think Armani would have like did Mad Lads and built the exchange. I don't think the Tensor guys would have been like, oh, we can beat Magic Keaton, even though they have 90% of market share, right? Like some people just like go hardcore when they see like, oh, this biggest competitor is now like spread across five different ecosystems. There's no way they can keep focused. That's like a, a once in a lifetime opportunity for some folks that have that kind of energy and um seeing them rewarded for the work that they put in i think is like the best thing that could happen in the ecosystem because it's really really rewarding the people that put in the work like that's that's like the beauty of bitcoin and proof of work right is that somehow through game theory it anonymously does that (laughs) and it's (laughs) magic (laughs) and that like doesn't always work out you know what would you say was um, the reason why? Maybe this answer isn't so like the same for everyone, but um, wh- why did people stay? What made people stick around Solana versus? I mean, there's like other high throughput chains that they could have gone to. Yep. Like, so what about Solana um, kept them there? I think um, the tech is pretty weird. Like, it's very different from everyone else, and it has like some unique properties. It obviously is riskier, right? Like, you do a bunch of weird optimizations that people think look at you crazy when you do them, it takes years for them to like mature and like prove themselves out. And like the folks that are deep in the tech, they kind of get why we made those choices and they appreciated them. And like, literally like the mango guy said, okay, we'd have to like create our own chain, like DYDX, that was, that's their alternative. Or we use Solana and like they felt that the being part of an ecosystem is better than being kind of running your own L1. Mm -hmm. Um, So a lot of people like made the choice, I think for that reason, for the tech reason. And I think when you have like a good group of those, like you kind of have a lot of people around them that want to build simply because um, I don't know if it's validation or like, you know, like I want to build where a bunch of other smart people build. That's, I think, largely, you know, one of the best things about Ethereum is you like talk to Dan Crowd and you're like, wow, actually, this guy's super smart. How do I like work with him? <laughs> it's like the mm-hmm. best selling point of Ethereum. <laughs> uh, but like we're starting seeing that happen in Solana and it's not the researchers that I think are like kind of the, the cornerstone of Ethereum. It's more like the low level devs that like kind of can grind really cool implementations and stuff. So I, I think there's something to, to be said about that. One of my favorite questions to ask Bitcoiners 
um, is and, they, and one of the reasons why is because the answer is always the same, mostly the same, depending on which Bitcoin you ask. They always kind of more or less say the same answer. But if you ask the Bitcoiners the question, like, wh- what's the most important element of Bitcoin that really like powers the whole system. And like the answer is so incredibly uniform. They're like, well, Bitcoin is really a semblance of many different components and technologies. And it's really about how they all come together to produce Bitcoin. But really the answer is the difficulty adjustment. Like the they love the difficulty adjustment. And it's like this keystone thing that puts Bitcoin together in a way that the other components are more ancillary. It, so if I ask you the question, like what what is that for Solana? Is that a fair question, or is it just apples to oranges because Bitcoin's question. just so different? Yeah. That's a really good question, but it's a really mm-hmm. hard one because I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know if we have like a linchpin, like super clever thing. I think maybe the parallelism, like that, we were able to figure out through like ex- failure and experimentation, that like we were able to like get it working all the way up to the economics. I think that was a really cool innovation. But Okay, let's listen like, back then then. Why is that so important yeah. and why was it so hard? <laughs> well, like it's really not obvious. Mm-hmm. And um, we basically see s- all these systems now that are getting inscription on them. <laughs> like the fees blow up because... Like the inscription locus. Yeah. And like what happened with Solana was effectively similar attack not a tag, but people using the the chain mm-hmm. is that instead of seeing inscription locus, we saw like the everything gets saturated to the point of like you cannot land a transaction. It was effectively liveness failures, right? Like uh, for 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 users, like DeFi wouldn't operate when there's an NFT mint at the same time, right? Like so, and that was really obvious in retrospect because it's kind of like if you worked at a big web company. And you have a database, you get these hotspots when like everyone wants to like order some weird thing all at the same time, but then all your other payments can't go through because there's this massive queue for something, for some random viral thing. Um, happens in every database system with any traction. Um, but like it took, it took me seeing it on chain to kind of unpack it and recognize it, that this is a problem that has a like similar computer science issue in, in the real world and tying it to the economics to deal with like kind of the, the economics around like making sure that you can isolate only that lock. And literally we got lucky with SVM having this idea of access lists that are required with every transaction. We did that for performance reasons because that's the fastest way to, to build the runtime. But having that information is what allows us to do it uh, now in every part of the stack and the economics of it itself. So kind of like, it was not planned, right? Like I was like, what's the fastest possible virtual machine? I copied the designs that I knew worked in DSPs and GPUs is that the developer does this very painful process of telling the system, this is exactly what memory I'm gonna touch. So it wasn't like magic. It was not as, <laughs> I mean, I had the benefit of having that experience or worked in, in tech for like a decade to know that that's the fastest thing. But I didn't know that this is like the most critical piece for crypto. And then when we saw those failures, we we had we had to solve them. Or I think the idea of a single global public chain that with many shared applications all using the same state was kind of dead on arrival. Like if we can, if like, if global fee spike, parallelism doesn't matter, right? Like right. you have one use case that saturates the whole thing. No one cares if it, how many TPS it can do. <laughs> like it's just irrelevant, <laughs> right? Like, so luckily, like we did the right steps, failed the right way. And like the solution was like kind of obvious. So I think that's maybe what makes Solana unique is we kind of, through a very long path, uh, we found like, I think the right answer of how to build like a shared permissionless system. And then that answer, what, what is the technical name name for this? So I, so I use the right name. It's we the, call them the local fee markets. Yeah. Local fee markets. And that that's where like, if I'm coding up, I'll, I'll put this into, I actually just did this episode with um, Lucas from from Gito. And so I was putting it into Ethereum terms just because like, that's how I, I think. And that's probably what the listeners are familiar with. So like, for example, if we had local fee markets on the Ethereum layer one, and you made some ARB transaction to balance Uniswap and Sushi Swap, you would like... Yeah 
you're the, what you're saying is the developers of wherever that transaction is originating from would say, okay, I need to specify to the Solana ecosystem, to the Solana SVM, I'm going to go touch the Uniswap contract or specifically the USDC Ether pool of Uniswap. Yep. And then I would also be touching the Ether USDC pool contract address of yep. SushiSwap. And that's the only thing that I'm touching. Yep. And anything else I don't care about. And that's yep. that's how we get parallelism, right? As in the, like other things but, can specify yep. their things over there. And since they're not overlapping, we get parallelism. So it's, it's local fee markets it produces parallelism is that right yeah it, what what it's what i uh believe the technical term for this in database land is isolation mm. because you have transaction isolation so one transaction another one are isolated from each other and when you have isolation you can ex execute them in parallel and have the exact same result regardless what order they're executed in so, but what's cool is once you do that, once you specify that in a transaction, that information is available in the mempool. So then your block producer is gonna like, be like, okay, I'm gonna fill up the block with the highest priority fees. And if the runtime, then the virtual machine says, okay, you've saturated all the USDC, uni, like mar like transactions that could hit this specific market, you cannot add any more to the block, but you still have block space for other stuff. Then the block producers can skip all the high priority fees and defer them to the next block, but then take all the lower priority ones that don't touch that saturated pool. And that's what creates this kind of like isolation and localization of fees right. because you have this hotspot, everyone takes the, everyone still is greedy. Right. So they fill up the hottest market, but then they're like, well, I still have space. So why don't I take all this other stuff that is like noise or whatever? So <laughs> that was the, you know, that's what we figured out had to be done for us to be able to support multiple like payments, NFTs, and DeFi, right? Like the, the big three use cases. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, as stretching the metaphor, even though this is apples to oranges, this is what you're saying is, if the Bitcoin, the difficulty adjustment is to Bitcoin, isolationism, par parallelism, local fee markets is to Solana. Maybe, I hope. Like, But I feel like smart people, engineers, I think everyone is probably looking at what works for Solana and is like, okay, this is how I can apply it to my technology. So we're going to start seeing, I think, that gap narrow, but... Crypto man, shipping software and crypto sucks. So like, <laughs> what, you, what you think you can do in like six weeks takes six months, no matter what. <laughs> mm. So I think Solana has been, I think, entering this um, a new phase for itself, specifically with like the, the Gito airdrop. There's like this before and after moment in the Gito airdrop where like you kind of had like the Solana diehards, the Solana true glassers throughout the bear market who stuck around. And now that the Gito airdrop happened, now it's attracted people who weren't previously attracted to Solana for like the economics reasons, for the incentive reasons, for for like people understanding that this is kind of where the meta is. And that, that's one way I would describe the, the chapter or the phase shift for Solana. But another one is happening just like with some of the fundamentals here, which is like, Fire Dancer is now a second client. Jito itself is a second client. Maybe there's another other other clients coming online as well. And so this is now once you have multiple clients, you now have the governance conversation. And so there seems to be like a lot of couple turnings of pages all kind of happening at the same time, making it seem like there's a kind of a before after moment for Solana as it relates to like the last like six weeks or so. Yeah, that's pretty cool to see. Like, I mean, <laughs> so Fire Dancer is a complete rewrite. Cheeto is another distribution of the Solana Labs client, but it does all the all the human bus factor kind of problems. You have now multiple points of failure, and that creates the governance problems. It's like how how do we make sure that like changes that Cheeto makes don't break mainnet, changes that Labs make don't break Cheeto, and don't break don't delay Fire Dancer. Like everyone's got to talk. This is why I'm writing more docs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Alignment is now a thing. How do, how, do I, <laughs> how do I get all of these like engineers uh -huh. that like are experts in the deep part of the stack that they're in, way deeper than me at this point? Mm -hmm. Don't like all spread in different directions and make sure that there is like kind of one one horizon roadmap that we're working towards. Um, that's definitely a new problem, but it's a good problem to have. It means that like the 
you know, people, it means you have a lot of people trying to, trying to move the ship. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, coming from Ethereum land, there's all of this like infrastructure set up around Ethereum governance, right? You're like, you have the biweekly all core devs call. Now it's split into two calls, the EL call and the CL call. Uh, there's like the Ethereum magicians forums. Uh, what, what does this kind of like coordination infrastructure look like Solana or is that kind of still getting, um, built? Um there's a call Jacob Creech runs. There's a validator call to kind of more like DevOps system stuff. There's a specific core developer call between all the teams. Uh, there's a Discord with all the different channels for different teams and kind of like, there's now a SIMD process, Solana improvement documents you, you post on GitHub, everyone reviews them. Um, all that stuff is getting, that was there before, but now people, like it was good that we kind of like had set these things up, but people are now using them because the ne there's a necessity to use them. Like setting this stuff up is easy, right? Like it just takes one person to run them, but none of it matters un un until you have like a critical mass of people that don't know what the hell is going on. So mm -hmm. <laughs> then they're forced to talk. There's usually smart people. They're for they go and they're like, well, who do I talk to? Or do I find who do I talk to? And you kind of start mm -hmm. seeing that happening. I think the the interesting thing that I'm I'm seeing is like Solana the archetype of Solana is super strong. It's like these low level systems engineers, these database designers like yourself. Uh, and now with this like whole phase change of Solana, the evolution of of Solana into something greater uh, is now needing a new archetype, which is like the governance archetype. And I. Like the Solana engineering archetype, I'm not sure has a lot of just like uh, governance muscle because I don't think most people to have governance muscles by default. Like I think Ethereum has attracted the governance nerd snipes because that's kind of what it is. But I don't know if the engineers have a lot of governance muscle about them. So, so I think, I don't know if this happened in Ethereum, but I think out of necessity, you kind of start building like a constitution or a motto Right. Mm -hmm. And for, I think for Ethereum, it was like cheap as possible hardware. Like, how do we make this like ver ver verifiability as accessible as possible? And everyone mm -hmm. that's building always thinking about that. And for me, I'm trying to drill into everyone. How do you make it faster? Like, just <laughs> what is like when you're like have 50 different options and you got to pick one or the other, which one is like, more scalable, faster, scales and more cores. And that's forcing all the discussions to kind of like pick out of the set of like permutations of every configuration, like, okay, we should go down this path. And this is a way I think that like, it's like a religious ma mantra, right? Yeah, Everyone yeah, yeah. repeats. It's, it's the Solana North Star. It's <laughs> yeah. Solana alignment. Right, right, exactly. Um, and this is, this is not to knock on Ethereum in any way. I think like, once you get to a certain size of the ecosystem, I think you kind of have to pick that, like, what's the core Pareto efficient spot that we're staking out and, like, have everyone aligned towards that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, like, Bitcoin picked its own spot, yeah. right? <laughs> and it's worked out for them. Like, right. you know, despite of all the criticism that everyone throws at Bitcoin core and the community, it's still, like, pretty successful, right? I would, I wouldn't... I wouldn't believe it if Solana got there, right? It would be a, like crazy <laughs> in my mind. So wait, what, what would you say is Bitcoin's North Star? Because I, I, I have my answer. I just want to want to hear yours. I, I think it's the fossilization of the supply cap, that it's like the yeah, immutability the of it. Cap. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's just like the whole idea of like... It's, you get a piece of something that no one can change <laughs> and you can like <laughs> hide in your bunker <laughs> and <Right>. like <laughs> count, Uber count property the bits rights, in your yeah. ledger, right? Like mm. <laughs> in your air gapped, whatever cold storage you can. <laughs> yeah. I think but When it comes to like tribal, tribal wars in the crypto space, I think like, and, and e honestly, even some Bitcoiners will point at this and be like, yo, that doesn't work in the fullness of time, right? Like I think Nick Carter and Hazu were famous Bitcoiners and Nick Carter, Nick Carter's still a Bitcoiner, you know? Um, but they'll, they'll point at the supply cap and be like, yeah, eventually you just, that just drives, you just drive off the cliff with that. Uh, and so like there's some, some North stars actually, uh, you know, explode, if you will, uh, before, before they actually get there. Right. 
Not if you have inscriptions and <laughs> I guess it's good enough. <laughs> I mean, inscriptions break and solve everything. Yeah, God. <laughs> okay, so what are some of the more, more important conversations going on in Solana land these days? Because there's the governance conversation, um, but what else is there? I think, like, uh, the trade-offs with, like, fixing, like, bugs and improvements versus fire dancer shipping faster. Those are like real hard questions. Like, cause I think we have some obvious flaws that are not, that haven't like caused a catastrophic failure yet, but like stuff like the, um, the storage fees are, are like hard coded. And as the price of soul goes up, it becomes more expensive right. and then impacts developers. And at some point, like the easy solution is like, okay, there's a governance effectively hard fork process to lower the hard code number until the actual solution is shipped after fire dancer. It's just like engineers don't like that because it's, uh, we know the bug, we want to fix it. Right. So there's like this, like right. need to like fix the wrinkles and stuff, but you also have to coordinate. So I think like tons of discussions like that are basically all swirling around. Like I know what the problem is. Like, how do we solve it? But how do we also make sure that fire dancer ships? Because having, um, to me, in my mind, that reducing the single points of failure, the code base, uh, is the most important thing right now to really how, like. How would that thing uh, actually like? How how is that a single point of failure? The storage costs? No, like the not having like the single uh, Solana code base is a single point of failure. Oh, having fire dancer oh, yeah, out yeah, yeah, yeah. is the highest priority. Right. So like, but f fixing problems in the runtime requires both teams to solve them. And like mm. us, you know, like, even though we know what the problem is, if we're like, okay, there's a solution, it'll only take six weeks to implement, but then Fire Dancer is going to be six, six weeks later. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then just the worry is that we there's in that, that six weeks of time is a six weeks longer amount of time in which there's a single yeah. Solana client with a potential yeah. like service area for a, a catastrophic yeah. bug. Understood. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, my, yeah. my view is that like we do the alignment conversations now. We have the design, the North Star, this is how everything should work. But ship Fire Dancer as fast as possible and then start doing the work. And that's okay. I think like for like for everything that crypto needs this year, I believe Solana is scaled to the to meet the demand. Um mm. So like my, my view is that like we can delay the improvements until fire dancers out and then like, but like, it's really good to like have the design discussions now, poke all the holes in them. And like, that would actually be awesome if we had like, <laughs> like did all the work that we were, you know, that we were supposed to do three years ago, but like we can do it now and have like a really good design that everyone agrees on. <laughs> Wouldn't it be good if you have some of these like updates that are call it like low hanging fruit that everyone has an agreement on? Wouldn't it be good yeah. to like ship Fire Dancer and then be like, okay, we have this agreement on this direction for this smaller code change, but now we have two systems that we need to update. It can be like kind of a test net for governance across multiple yep. clients. Yep. That's basically like kind of the process that's happening. Yeah. And the Fire Dancer folks are awesome. They're developing some of these optimizations on their own because they kind of like see where we only went halfway and they're like, why didn't you guys do that? And we're like, well, we had to ship. <laughs> we mm -hmm. wouldn't be talking to you. <laughs> and like, and then they're like, okay, so we'll do the R and D and figure out how fast the difference is. So it's cool to see them do all this work. Okay. So let's, uh, there's, there'll be a handful of these throughout the conversation, I think. So let, I'll, I'll pull out, here's a, an Ethereum perspective on Fire Dancer uh, that um, maybe you can debunk or, or uh, provide the alternative opinion or perspective on. Uh, when I see Jump Crypto making a, Fire, uh, making a Solana client and the Solana community is like, oh, Fire Dancer is the best thing since sliced bread. And Jump Crypto, who is like famously extractive, totally probably like the right people for the job because you want the high frequency traders to make the high frequency client. That makes total sense. But then from like from the alternative side of things is like, I don't want these people who are masters at extraction to build the extraction client. That gives me the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> uh, what, what would you say to this? First of all, um, in the world of finance, right, the exchanges are the extractors. 
somebody like Jump pays like an arm and a leg to operate at an exchange, um, and they put their capital at risk. And with their brain power, they try to minimize latency of all the world's information, all the noise, find all the right signals, okay. and as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. get them to the exchange. And the exchange has just been there because somebody's uncle traded pork you know, a thousand years ago or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're not doing shit. <laughs> so in my view, like there is like value creation happening at the jump level. And I think what these systems that we're building, the permissionless open marketplaces do is they equalize the access. So now me as a hobbyist, I can compete with jump without having to pay the exchange and arm and a leg. Um, so that, that I think is like cool and will actually both jump, I think, wants this because they're competitive. And two, I think it'll actually compress the fees all, all across finance because there's more competition. Um, the other side of it, I think, is that uh, it's all open source code. Like, literally, like it is a bunch of Apache 2.0 code. You can go look at it. There is no magic if jump do this, <laughs> like, <laughs> right? Like, and then everyone has access to it across the ecosystem and across a crypto, right? So all the optimizations they do can actually, like, if they're interesting, apply them to Ethereum. Um, like, so from my perspective, I think it's kind of like silly. Like, it's just like the silliest arguments. It's just code, right? Like, doesn't matter who wrote the code. Um, I think the more interesting one is there a direction that Jump can influence Solana to where it creates an environment where they can somehow be more extractive? Mm. As, as in that like is, governance? Yeah. Like, well, direction of the protocol. Like, I think governance like, is not going to be stake weighted, but I think mm. core engineers have a lot of influence, right? Like sure. Linus right, has course. a lot of influence right. of on Linux, even though he's just one dude. Like he gets to make a lot of big design decisions. Is there like a directional like place where Jump could push Solana to where it somehow gives an advantage to incumbents like Jump and Citadel and like displaces hobbyists or whatever? That's a more interesting question. And like, what is that technology choice? What what would that even look like? Right? Like, so I think this is where like I think the community should be like serious, right? About like, what are we building? Does it actually improve access and stuff like that? I think, um, I think it's pretty unlikely just talking to the jump folks. They're like hardcore engineers. I don't, I don't think you can like even convince Kevin Bowers to like, okay, make <laughs> guide the architecture towards this place where we will extract more value we're like dude what you're wasting my time they're, they're not like fat. puppet masters they're yeah, just yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, I think that's like re very far-fetched um mm -hmm. but like i think it could accidentally get there and that's like a more right. interesting discussion and we should like be, be like constantly thinking about it like is the technology that we're building does it like allow like you know like me, when I graduated college, I was like trading on all of these dinky exchanges, but my connectivity sucked. I didn't have access to data. Everything was terrible. Like, I don't want that to happen to like the next Anatoly, right? Like maybe that guy figures out and, and like does a better job than jump. Cause like, this is where innovation comes from is people that don't know that they're competing against the best, right? They just, <laughs> yeah. So like. So I do get, I get I do get the argument that like uh, with the appropriate tech platform the middle ground the the arena if the arena is appropriately like engineered and architected in a way that like junk capital only has so much more of an edge over like the average Joe schmo that's great um, however like they will have economies of scale they employ people to do good work to do good jobs to succeed at their jobs and so yep. like I, I, uh, it's, it's great that we are taking down the silos of exchanges and we are making those decentralized and open and so uh, that centralization force that um, power capture extraction venue is eliminated and now like distributed through a more decentralized ecosystem that's great but then it kind of just creates a new kingmaker right it's which is whoever can play those markets the best so now that the markets what the walls around the markets are down but the players are now the new the new leaders if, if you will and so but it's like, kind of like 
But if Go they're ahead. doing yeah. real work, right? If they're like mm. looking at all of the world's information, synthesizing it as fast as possible, and like picking the highest priority things and pricing it correctly, and like if if they're doing the work, why shouldn't they earn some of the return? Like me as a hobbyist, I can do that work too, right? And I can find a an because the world is so big and is massive and it's a very long curve of like of events that happen there's no way jump or anyone else can capture all of it it's just too big sure. i would always i always believe like that i could always find an edge if i work hard enough i could i could like compete with them on one particular segment of the market beat them and then grow my own business right and then like eventually get to their level to where i am don't spend time on like the little <laughs> the, the edge cases and or worry only about the big markets that I care about. Like I, I think that's just like normal competition. Like as long as the access is free and open to everyone globally, I think that's fine. Um, mm -hmm. At least I don't see like a fundamental problem with it or like one that one that like defeats the purpose of like open permissionless networks. Yeah, I guess the concern is is a point taken for sure. I guess the concern is just like uh, is increasing the scale of capital, but getting capital. Like, how fast does one the best trader on Solana accrue more rewards faster than uh, like the medium trader on Solana? And if that gap is large, then then we're concerned. But if that gap isn't that large, and then then to what you're saying, just like, well, at some point they are doing real work. They are shifting the state of Solana to map the state of the real world, and that is valuable. We'll see, right? Like, I, I think, like, folks that are trying to think about how do they capture, I mean, this is like the problem, how do we capture MEV in the protocol, right? People trying to find solutions to this, I think it's unsolvable. Like, so you're going to have, like, I think the Ethereum approach, which is through crypto economics and auctions and a slow chain that can run this. And I think you're going to see the Solana approach is like physics. How do we make the chain so fast that it's physically impossible for like information to travel around the world? <laughs> and then like you have localization and, and like the physical forces basically kind of force a certain fairness. Like I can submit my transaction to the block producer that's closest to me. And that means that like, the amount of information that that thing can evaluate is only local to me and it doesn't have like full control of the of the global state no matter what happens so like can we like cut the latencies that low <laughs> and if we can then like it'll be cool to see which one's better right like maybe solana's worse maybe maybe ethereum captures more value for ethereum but the prices to the users are worse who knows right like i don't know right like it's we'll see what happens I think that is a pretty um, solid way to kind of uh, differentiate the strategies between Ethereum and Solana, where Ethereum is trying to like maximize in protocol value capture, whereas Solana, it, like maybe this will be my description, correct me if I'm wrong, but Solana is like trying to outrace MEV. It's just like, it's just trying to go faster than it. Uh, and it, it, the first thing you learn about MEV is that there's actually no eliminating it. You can only just like transfer it elsewhere. Yep. Um, and, and Ethereum is like, well, we're going to go sl be slow and expensive and we're going to capture all of that value and it's going to be placed into Ether. And uh, Ether is desired to be this highly decentralized distributed asset that everyone has access to. One of the easiest things you can do in crypto is, buying, is buy Ether and all of a sudden you have exposure to Ethereum fees and Ethereum M MEV. And Solana on the other side of things is like, well, well, we're just going to have block times that are so incredibly fast that someone captures it by the time that that information permeates to the other side of the uh, other side of the world. Which does uh, one thing I did learn is like small blocks, fast block times uh, do uh, does is actually a mechanism to lower total MEV. But doesn't it then it just kind of displaces it into like latency games. But that's but I think what the Solana theory or Solana strategy is that like well those latency games will happen in like a local part of the globe. And those games won't be global games, they'll be local games. And those people are doing work, they're racing, right? And then like, if the message bus that they're all synchronizing on is the fastest one there, then it's creating value for the whole world because then if I'm on the other side of the world, I get this reference point that's most trusted. And in theory, if the way that it's, this message bus is really valuable, the token that, you know, prevent spam and this message bus should accrue some of the value. But again, I don't know. <laughs> Let's just pick up <laughs> notes. <laughs> we'll see. This is like, I think, 
the hardest part is like figuring out what happens when these systems scale and like really take over real finance. Like right now, what do we have? Like dog coins and NFTs and inscriptions. And mm -hmm. it's almost like, honestly, it's the perfect amount of risk. It's like risky, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but like, we're not risking the global economy. Like right. there's enough skin in the game that everyone's taking it seriously and trying to like do their best job, but it's, you know, it's still humans writing software. It's not going to like, doesn't matter if dog money like fails or not. <laughs> yeah, it is real capital, but at least inside of it, it's in a doggy container. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, not a pension container. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, the, what it does, so the incoming bull market, which I think everyone has assumed that, that we're getting Solana activity reaching new, new heights, I think, um, uh, it's gonna does, be close. Pretty close. Yeah. Does the future influx of a bunch of new users scare you? So like we had two million active accounts with Stepin mm -hmm. uh during its peak. And what I learned is that like these kind of like hyper economically incentivized users have a steep onboarding and then a steep drop off if the activity they're doing is not like creating daily value or something like that. And these like economic kind of bursts, like you'll have like, what's cool is that I think these users are like basically like already crypto users. They all have seed phrases and you can see that like once somebody figures out how to deal with any wallet, <laughs> they can switch relatively easily, right? Their mental model is already set up for this. And this is what I believe is like the key part of like, the growth in crypto industry is how many people figure out a seed phrase is like the total number of addressable users. And then after that, like, it's just, I think the switching costs of somebody installing an extension, one or the other are pretty minimal. So I think you can see that like all, all the pieces are there. And if the only thing that we figured out are speculative, like kind of economically incentivized games, I don't think it'll last, but uh, if we figure out, some real world use cases that create value for those users, they'll be stickier and they'll stick around. And I think the latter is still unproven. And I hope that this bull cycle is the one where like real world applications kind of get some traction, like a payments thing or something, right? Like Helium, I feel like is infra that I feel like the users that are using it are not gonna like be crypto users. They're they're Helium network users. I think the idea that you can get tokens for creating a quality of the of the map is at least enough to onboard them to a wallet and get a seed phrase. But like, I want like a Venmo. <laughs> why can't we have Why can't we have a crypto Venmo that's global? Mm -hmm. Everyone's sending each other real currencies, euros, dollars, and it works. Uh, like something like that, where where it's useful. So. This is my biggest story. Like I look at the numbers, I'm glad it's happening. And like, I'm glad that the network's not falling over while it's happening even more, <laughs> that the fees are not spiking. That's like pat myself on good engineering. But like, we need to see real world use cases that I feel like are sticky to the point that users aren't gonna leave. Yeah, I would say that's kind of like the identity crisis that I'm seeing unfold for the entire industry kind of in slow motion is like everyone's realizing that like, it was really fun to build insular apps for like almost a decade now. And also we've gotten every single person nerd sniped about crypto who would ever be nerd sniped about that. And now if we're ever going to like, you know, get further reaches, it has to take a new kind of app. Um, but that's not even like a Solana, Ethereum, you know, Polkadot, Cosmos conversation. That's just like a, yo, what can we really do with crypto conversations? And like, there's differing, per differing perspectives as to like how far crypto can go. Uh, in terms of its utility, right? Have you are you a reader of uh, Polenia's blogs at all? No. You know Polenia. Uh, you know the the, the oh, he's yeah, a, yeah, 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 yeah. The, or they they are a, oh, yeah, uh, I, uh, more Ethereum oh, yeah. aligned. I've read his writer. blogs. Yeah yeah yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they they think that like the case for crypto use cases is actually like much smaller than what everyone in like crypto land is giving credit for. Cause they're like, okay, look at the utilities. It's Bitcoin and it's the ether is store values. It's stable coins for payments. And that's about it. And isn't, everything else. But isn't he arguing for a million L2s? 
as well uh, in the same breath? That I don't, I can't remember a specific blog <laughs> writing about okay. that, but I, I wouldn't be surprised. Okay. <laughs> I think I think he might be more in the uh, f- one l- fewer number of larger L2s, like okay. one like yeah. a power law of layer twos. Yeah. But I yeah. think he is. I think I think they are uh, definitely like an app chain thesis person, but more for like I think gaming chains. I'm starting to put words in their mouth. So like okay. games get their own chains, for okay. example. But beyond that, I think it's like power law distribution for layer twos. Anyways, uh, the the conversation I was bringing up is just like. I think like crypto is kind of, and it swings between pendulums of like optimism and pessimism, right? Like on the optimistic side of things, we have like, oh, we can tokenize everything. We can tokenize blockchains and supply chains and we can, uh, you know, map map the world and there's going to be a token. Everything's going to be a token, token economy, token economy. Uh, and then on the other side of things, it's like, uh, you know, Bitcoin maximalism, extreme conservatism is like, no, there's only one blockchain. It does one thing, which is produce Bitcoin and Bitcoin is money and all other utilities is just like a complete farce and I think depending on where you fall in the spectrum you kind of find yourself in different like ecosystems of crypto and I would definitely place Solana on the more optimistic version of the yeah. crypto utility it's hyper right? optimistic like, hyper I mean, optimistic I mean, yeah, yeah I, f- I feel like if the I, f- I feel like if the western world doesn't accept crypto as a industry Solana is worth it's it's like useless no, no mm. one's gonna care like the only reason to have a high throughput low cost chain is if it like is adapted like at the consumer level to, to like normal voting citizens like mm-hmm. use it on a daily basis right like otherwise what's the point so like i feel like yeah i'm hyper optimistic i would say i feel like legally it'll be like basically enshrined and we'll have some some way to operate and launch decentralized systems and all this stuff will happen. Every bank is going to have a stable coin and, and yada, yada, yada. But like, yeah, I think, <laughs> I, I don't know. I think like if, I also think in that world, uh, something like Bitcoin or the ultrasound money, like narrative where you have like the cockroach chain mm-hmm. is really important because it kind of forces the question. Like if you, right. if it's, if if the the cost to shut down Bitcoin in the Western world is Orwellian, like it requires massive surveillance and interruption of normal people's lives, it's too it's too far politically difficult, and that that forces the question for people to be like, okay, fine, here's your box, right. go do it. <laughs> right, 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 right. Are, are you like saying not- that like? People are realizing that they'll never be able to shut down Bitcoin. And so therefore, like, well, if we're not going to shut can. down Bitcoin, we might as well just like keep Ethereum and then we'll keep Solana and we'll just keep all the the less uh, hardened ones too. I think it's, uh, they can shut it down. But if, the, it, if it requires so much political capital, right? So right. much, such a huge invasion of privacy and individual right. liberty that it's not politically viable. That means mm-hmm. that, it's not going to be shut down because we still, I believe, live in like a fairly representative world. And that forces the con- the conversation to be like, okay, if we, if like, it's not practical to shut down Bitcoin, then what, what are the green lines, right? For, for all this stuff. Mm-hmm. So like that, that's kind of like, I don't know, Solana's cheating, right? We're like, okay, <laughs> Bitcoin survives. <laughs> <Your game> survives. <laughs> Here's a really fast blockchain that, Gives you trust minimization, but requires data centers and all that. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, it's like Solana's like the third kid that the two older kids like are watching yep. their parents just treat way nicer than they were yep. ever treated Bitcoin and Ethereum, and they're both like, "Why aren't you? Why aren't you bullying the third kid as hard?" <laughs> exactly. <laughs> one one like phase change in Ethereum land or like uh, development milestone of, of Ethereum. I always kind of like look at these systems as like literal kids, children sometimes, like Bitcoin, older brother, Bitcoin. Bitcoin's like probably in college, maybe about to graduate from college. Ethereum is like entering college. Um, Solana, Solana is like still middle school, high school somewhere. Um, <laughs> but Ethereum uh, uh, went through this one like development milestone when it had its whole like Tornado Cash OFAC moment where that was like a big growing up moment for Ethereum. Yep. Like it was no longer like dog tokens and Ponzi games. It was like, yo, you are 
uh, infiltrating the space of the most powerful office in the land, which is just like the Department of Defense, Department of Treasury, like uh, threatening the dollar, threatening global security of of the United States. And then all of a sudden you saw like uh, the, the OFAC ruling go out about tornado cash is now uh, you can't touch that. And then we saw like 85% censored blocks on Ethereum inside of a span of a few short months. And all the Bitcoiners are like, oh, told you Ethereum was totally like, you know, not ready to fight nation states. And then the percentage of OFAC censored blocks on Ethereum has now been down only ever since that moment, down to 33%. And now I would call it that, that's an Ethereum's rear view mirror. It's successfully like passed that milestone. And, you know, watching Solana enter its economics and governance phase of its development, which is the part that like really interests me, Eventually, I'm like, well, if if all of the Solana community wants Solana to have the successes that they want it to have, it will one day enter that very big conversation conversation of like threatening nation state powers. How close do you think we are? And what do you think the Solana system yeah. ecosystem is ready for this? Like, what do you think about this? I'm not ready for it because I'm just an engineer. <laughs> I <bet> you are. <laughs> <laughs> I have no clue how to deal with this. I will be like, man, this, that's the, the, the stuff that like really churns my stomach and that I'm terrified mm-hmm. of because I don't know what to do. I would like reach out to Coin Center and be like, well, what do Please we do? Help. help. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. I think like at the same time, I have very, very strong beliefs that like, the West where we live, it's a place of freedom. Like my parents fled the fucking Soviet Union and like, I want to protect it right against bad actors. I will do everything I can to like stop bad actors from like preventing me to pursue happiness in the United States. It's like a beautiful thing to be able to like work on whatever I want and do like learn whatever I want and say whatever I want right in the U S. So like I, I man, yeah, I don't know. Like these are like the the really hard questions. I hope it's that those decisions come as far into the future as possible. Mm-hmm. Well, the if the trajectory maps on, like Solana is like one cycle behind Ethereum, Ethereum's one cycle behind Bitcoin. It would if the tra- trajectory continues, it would generally like if enough stable coins find themselves on Solana, and there's enough apps with you know, like holes in them that have high TVL, it's going to attract like the dubious actors such as like the Lazarus group, which Ugh. is going to like, that's going to ha- that, that's wouldn't that happen at the tail end of this bull market? Yeah, I hope not. <laughs> this, is, this is like terrifying. <laughs> we can, we can brush that one under the rug yeah, yeah. and, and circle back around that in like two years. Yep. With MetaMask Portfolio, swapping tokens on-chain has never been easier. Swap tokens at any time with the most competitive pricing around. The MetaMask Portfolio swap feature allows you to swap tokens directly by aggregating and comparing various decentralized exchanges to ensure you get competitive prices and low network fees. Choose the token you want to swap from and what you want to swap into and tap into combined liquidity across providers all automatically. Within MetaMask Portfolio, you can easily swap tokens with low fees, fewer approvals, and slippage protection for all of your trades manage your web3 everything at metamask.io slash portfolio arbitrum is the leading ethereum scaling solution that is home to hundreds of decentralized applications arbitrum's technology allows you to interact with ethereum at scale with low fees and faster transactions arbitrum has the leading DeFi ecosystem strong infrastructure options flourishing nfts and is quickly becoming the web3 gaming hub explore the ecosystem at portal.arbitrum.io are you looking to permissionlessly launch your own arbitrum orbit chain arbitrum orbit allows anyone to utilize arbitrum's secure scaling technology to build your own Orbit chain, giving you access to interoperable, customizable permissions with dedicated throughput. Whether you are a developer, an enterprise, or a user, Arbitrum Orbit lets you take your project to new heights. All of these technologies leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum. Experience Web3 development the way it was always meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free. Visit Arbitrum.io and get your journey started in one of the largest Ethereum communities.
Celo is the mobile-first, EVM-compatible, carbon-negative blockchain built for the real world. And now, something big is happening. Introducing the Celo Layer 2. It's a game-changing proposal that's going to bring Celo's rapidly growing ecosystem home to Ethereum. Vitalik has shared its excitement for the Celo Layer 2 on the Celo Forum, so has Ben Jones from Optimism. But why? The Celo Layer 2 will bring huge advantages, like a decentralized sequencer, off-chain data availability, and one block finality. What does all that mean? Rock-solid security, a trustless bridge to Ethereum, and more real world use cases for Ethereum without compromise. And real world adoption is happening. Active addresses on Celo have grown over 500% in the last six months. With the Celo Layer 2, gas fees will stay low and you can even pay for gas using ERC20 tokens. But Celo is a community governed protocol. This means that Celo needs you to weigh in and make your voice heard. Join the conversation in the Celo forum. Follow at Celo org on Twitter and visit Celo.org to shape the future of Ethereum. Well, one thing that's uh, I've been noticed going on uh, is the the Bonk token. Actually, let's start with Bonk. What the hell is Bonk? Um, this was like a project launched by Nam and a bunch of like random ecosystem devs and like participants, right when like kind of the whole narrative storm was happening uh, last year, like literally mm -hmm. one year ago. D Gods left, Solana, Magic Eden announced they're going multi chain, Phantom announced they're going multi chain all like in one week. Right. Everything was in the dumpster, and these kids launched Bonked, and like it was a hit. Like it's a dog coin. I don't, I mean, like the only purpose is to like send somebody 669 420 Bonk and laugh about it. <laughs> like what else? <laughs> it has no other purpose be beyond that, right? <laughs> so, like, uh, but like for whatever reason, I think maybe because it was launched at that like worst possible moment and like people had nothing else to do, it, it like just was kind of like, okay, I guess we'll do bonk. And that became a hit. Um, well, I don't was know, it honestly, in response I, to like people leaving the ecosystem? It was like, hey, we're going to make this for the people sticking around? I don't know. I honestly don't know the motivation, but it felt like... It also felt like the bear market was already well underway, right? Like, so people were like kind of itching, looking for an excuse and like the events, like the FTX collapse and everything. It was just such a bottom that maybe like, I don't know, maybe that was the motivating trigger. I don't know. Like, I, I mm -hmm. don't fully comprehend how these things work, how dog mm -hmm. coins work. <laughs> okay. So, but why did Bonk become Bonk? So they made Bonk, but like, why did it become what it is? Well, I think like everyone was experiencing very shared trauma all at the same time. And everyone was plugged in online looking for the next terrible news to drop, right? <laughs> and like nobody else had anything else to do. Like you just had this like dog coin. So I guess we're doing like, I don't know. It's bizarre like how these things catch virality. Like it's just what what makes something viral, I think, is like, uh, I don't know, I'm an engineer. If I knew, I'd be doing something <laughs> else. <laughs> okay, so uh, what, what, how, how did Bonk like, permeate throughout Solana? Like, why, why do so many Solana people have Bonk? Um, they did like a big airdrop across all the NFT communities. And Solana, like users are pretty NFT ha heavy. Um, like even I like have bought NFTs and stuff. So like... They did a really good job filtering for Sybils and kind of looking at like active people with like NFTs, incredible communities and stuff. And like the, these, did this whole like distribution process. And for whatever reason, it like just didn't go to zero. I don't know why, but like that gave people like this influx of like, oh, this thing is like worth something and it's kind of happening. And like it caught fire. I don't know why or how, but like it, got a little virality like a year ago and then like everything else like everything was contracting rapidly after that like mm -hmm. i think we kind of survived that moment like vitalik saved solana right with that tweet or something <laughs> like that it was like vitalik and bonk at the same time happened uh -huh. and kind of like breathed some life into us long enough for like devs to go start shipping more products and like they just continued building integrations into like every DeFi marketplace, every NFT project and like kept talking about it and like the community just wouldn't die. And I think as Mad Lads happen and Backpack launch and like kind of the all the announcements around Breakpoint, like you just saw that the ecosystem was alive. 
I don't know if that's the reason why Solana got back in the news or like in the positive like cycle, but like that's the only explanation that makes sense to me is like the devs shipped a bunch of products, they attracted users, and that kind of starts the ball rolling. Um, so yeah, the meme was like just meme enough with the right amount of, of fundamental because yeah. it, it seems like Bonk has like a lot more of uh, the spirit of Solana in it than like. Shibu Inu has anything about Ethereum. Like the Shibu Inu community and the Ethereum community are like those Venn diagrams don't overlap. But the Bonk and, ben, and Solana ecosystems, those are like pretty strongly overlapping. I think it's because the devs are plugged into the NFT developers. And like mm. a lot of the developers on Solana, like like there's like two groups, the the Jerry's Ellipsis people that are like the super DeFi nerds and mev nerds like cheeto and then there's the nft people that are like metaflex and all these other mm. t- t- monkey business and d gods even but like they're all like kind of building web tools and a bunch of stuff that are fun for people to use and there's some intersection between them but there's clearly like two different kind of devs um and like i think the bonk folks were really plugged in to both and they were able to just kind of like connect both of these like i don't know the campfire between the two parties yeah exactly (laughs) Uh and then okay so but there's a bunch of bonk on all the solana phones how did that happen um that was like one of the uh one of the theories that we had is that like we basically get nft pro like everyone gets this phone it's a pain in the ass to ship apps to the big app stores but if we if like if the phones have like NFT drops and stuff like that, then the kind of people that get the phone will self-select to be the people that care about those things. And that means then developers can ship apps to like a target rich environment, even though it's small, but a target rich one of NFT consumers and, and, and folks like that. So we like talk to every NFT project and like Klano's and, you know, we talk to the, the devs from Bonk, like, can you guys do like a small airdrop? It was like 10 bucks or something at the time. Um, so just as, like as a perk to have the phone. Yeah. It was not like, there's no like master plan there to like, oh, the price of bonk is going to pass the price of the phone. And <laughs> Wait, so has that happened? Because, okay, so like during for, the bear market. Mo- yeah, during the bear market, nobody cared. Nobody cared bonk's about the phone. Nothing. Yeah. Bonk's worth nothing. We were selling like 20. It was weird. We're selling like 20 to 30 phones a day, kind of trickling them out. And it's like weirdly, because it's like, okay, there's traction. Most DeFi protocols are not gaining 20 to 30 users every day. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But you need to sell 20,000. That's going to take years to get there. (laughs) So didn't the Solana phone project like sunset? formally and then the bonk token price like jumped no we had like uh the team that we didn't sunset it the team is there we like kind of went into cockroach mode like how do we like figure out what to do with it and like get people excited about it but like spend the least amount to like extend runway for the for that team so like what happened i think is like right after breakpoint we started sales kind of doubled or tripled. So we were like Mm -hmm. selling 50 to 75, which is great, but like it was still pretty slow. And then Bonk kind of took off. And then for like people realized, oh man, the Bonk airdrop is now worth like half the phone. I think that's like, okay, the phone is effectively half price, right? Like, or like if you have some Bonk, you could literally sell it by the phone and get the phone to like equalize, right? Like, um, so you still had to go like spend money to get this phone. So even though like, even if it's worth like 10, 20 bucks, it's going to take 10 days to deliver. Rationally, I don't think any person would be like, I'm going to get 10% more bonk in right. 10 days. It's not about the arm of bonk. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it never went off like twice as much or, or 10 X as much as the price of the phone to where the arm makes sense. It was like maybe 10 to 20% more, um, so like enough people got it, like, or got excited about it to sell out. So in one day we sold like 15,000 units, which is bizarro. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine what was, what like, was like the next highest day that you had like, prior to that. 
Yeah, like maybe 50 or 75 50 phones? or something. No, like I think we sold like at the start, we sold like uh-huh. a couple hundred in the first day. Uh-huh. Um, what was funny is that like literally I was on Laura Shin's podcast earlier. I was like, yeah, we only sold 2,500. I don't know what we're going to do next. We're trying uh-huh. to figure out. So like, and then there were like all these articles, Solana phone is a flop. <laughs> like, <laughs> and literally three days later, we sell 15,000 of them. But like now... I don't know what to do either. Like, I think <laughs> this is the, this is like the big question. Like, uh, people are kind of treating it as an NFT, like a, kind of like a club. Um, and there's now devs shipping apps. Like the, the interest in terms of shipping apps is like 10 X. Um, the amount of airdrops that folks are getting or receiving is like kind of really picked up. Mm-hmm. So that thesis is working, but like to compete with Apple or Google in any meaningful way, you need to sell, a million phones. Right. Um, is this enough of a signal to go try to like the next stage would be like a hundred to 200,000. Like, is this enough of a signal to try to do the next stage? I mean, like, honestly, prior to this percent chance of us getting to that level was like 0.1. Now it's like five, which is like percent pretty good. Yeah, a massive improvement. Uh-huh. <laughs> so like it's 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 probably worth it for us to continue, but we still have to like figure out what that looks like, how long it's gonna take, costs, what's the form factor. Is a shipping hardware is awesome. Like when you get mm-hmm. this you like work for a year and you like optimize and you build this very complex device and you can hold it in your hands like a real product and like you think it's awesome and you get it out and there are some reviewers like, hey, it's mediocre. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, the MHKBU, the YouTuber. Yeah, it's like it's a lot of phone. It's bad. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so like, it's great because it's so much work and it's so intricate and it's like all of human civilization has built out all these technologies for you to like ship this phone. Um, so it's really, really cool, but like, uh, <laughs> you'll always, <laughs> you'll always just like in, in one like review, it'll be like, ah, psh, it's, it's crap, it sucks. <laughs> if, if the Solana phone does take off as a result of this like bonk airdrop that's associated with every single phone and it also like meaningfully disrupts like Apple or Google, it will be the greatest most like it's facetious bizarre. crypto story I could yeah. ever have written. You couldn't have written that. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It would be bizarre. <laughs> it's like we live in a simulation then. Like mm-hmm. I think that's definitive proof. Um <laughs> Okay, so wait, so how does how does the airdrop per phone work? Because the airdrop of bonk supply eventually runs out. So like some phones won't have bonk in the future, or like what what's the detail? I mean, like that? if we ship another phone, it'd be another device like you would have a different Genesis token be like a different product. There's the 20,000 sagas that get made that that's it. Like that lo- manufacturing line has been shut down. Like you, we can't even ship anymore. Okay. Um. So like we'd have to build another product and then figure out how that thing's going to work. Right. But like the goal, I think so all, the, like, all this line of Genesis phones are sold out. Yep. Okay. Cause you said you, you sold fi- like 50,000 in one day, right? No, fifteen. Fifteen thousand. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so uh so oh so the D gens just bought them up to the limit. Yeah, yeah. That's all sold okay. out. <laughs> oh, amazing. All right, bizarre. well congrats. One hey, day. congrats for selling yeah, out the yeah. Solana phone. Yeah. Bizarre. Bizarre. Yeah, Solana phone is sold out. It was not a flop. <laughs> 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 but now okay. like I think, yeah, now we now we have to figure out what to do next. Um, right, because like it, you, I think if you're gonna make another phone, you have to ask like, can you get lightning to strike twice? Because like you sold the phone because of the bonk airdrop, not because of the phone, right? But the question is like if you have an an app store, enough devs will ship. Sure. to where the probability right, of okay. lightning is 100%, mm, right? Like understood. that's kind of like the theory. Mm-hmm. Um, and having an app store that's crypto first is like you own, we own our own destiny, right? Like we're not beholden to the Apples and Googles. Right. You can do whatever. It's awesome. Right. Like this, this is like the biggest unlock mm-hmm. I think we could possibly have. Uh, so if it's possible, if you can get the users to actually like get the phone, use it mm-hmm. for crypto stuff and like, it'd be really, really cool. 
I think uh, w- w- one of the conversations that I've seen happen in a number of different places, I, th- I think the first time I have heard this was um, just getting dinner with uh, John Charbonneau. Uh, and he just kind of gave me the thought experiment of like, imagine if friend.tech was built on Solana, not base. And imagine what that would have done to the Solana narrative when when friend tech took off. And this this was like, two months ago. So it was, this was a while ago. Um, and like listening to that thought experience, I'm like, oh yeah, like I- imagine how loud the Solana community would be on Twitter if it was friend tech on base, not on not on Solana. Like the entire narrative of Solana would have just like pivoted in, in an absolute heartbeat. And that was like, you know, three months ago, two months ago when, when friend tech was a thing. And then I was also having a conversation with Chris Bernisky, who's somewhere along those la- same la- uh, lines, just like, the and this was after Sol price goes from twenty to seventy something dollars and like the narrative uh, shifts the meta shifts towards Solana where he goes like yeah yeah Solana just is a pretty strong bet for like where a breakout consumer crypto app actually lands in this next like wave of adoption like if it's if it's going to be one space where that consumer app is built it, the Solana is the best like risk toward to place your bets uh, and so. It would be great in Atoli if we had a breakout consumer app because we haven't really had one. We kind of had one with Frentech and now it's kind of like died. Uh, what are your odds that the crypto industry, Solana or not, the crypto industry produces a breakout consumer app in like say the next like two years? I'm an optimist. So I'm going to say like 90%, 95 okay. I think these like next two years are going to be pivotal. And like, I think you should see a consumer application that that's like legitimate. Mm-hmm. Um, it does step in count as a legitimate consumer application. <laughs> if it like stuck around, I had this uh-huh. theory that maybe people are like, basically like if I'm paying my trainer, you know, like 50 bucks an hour that I would rather use the, the incentives that I'm getting from like the dopamine hook to the mm. kick kickers and trading and stuff mm-hmm. for me to run. If those are basically equivalent to what I get out of a trainer, then some segment of the population would just continue to use step in. But I don't know if the, I, it feels like that probably didn't like fully land, but there was like a, there was like a theory, right? Like the value that I'm getting out of it is the exercise and the motivation that I'm getting out of it is the crypto games that I get to play with the NFTs and the tokens and stuff. Cause that's pretty engaging for the brain, right? Like if I wake up and look at the prices and the competitiveness, I spent like countless hours on this on like Ultima Online trading like random resources that mm-hmm. nobody cares about, right? Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> if you could get those same hooks into somebody and force them to work out, it's a value add for the world. <laughs> um, but I don't know if that played, it didn't seem like that played out. Um, so I don't know if that's like the, play to earn, learn to earn kind of things right? are are the right meta. We'll see. But like, who knows? Yeah, to- token-inspired consumer apps always kind of like, it seems like, uh, um, it seems backwards where like, if you, you can't inspire human behavior based off of token incentives because then yeah. it becomes gamed, right? So it has to be something else. It has to be something a little bit more uh, sustainable, right? Random, boring, cross-border payments, like Euro USDC, like I don't know. <laughs> that would be like great Venmo. That's international, right? Like that works well. Um, that would be cool. Okay, let's. I want to uh, turn to Solana economics because we've actually seen some like Solana fees pick up uh, and actually like be pretty sustainable. Uh, where where do you find Solana in, t- so like in Ethereum, when I got into Ethereum, the monetary policy was we issue five Ether per block and then it got changed to three and then it got changed to two and then EIP 1559 was introduced and yep. then Proof of Stake was introduced and that's like the last update that there's been. Uh, if you had to like map Solana's uh, arc in terms of its like economic sustainability, where are we on that arc and like what's ahead of us? I think what's different is that like, so a bunch of validators compete on commission. So for users at stake, they pick the lowest commission validator and they basically experience no dilution, right? Like, but there is some dilution because a bunch of the tokens are on staked. So mm-hmm. those are the folks that are effectively paying this like kind of transfer of wealth from everyone that's staking to on staking and validators take a little cut of that in between. Um, 
it's hard to tell like how much like users are impacted because the warm and the cool down and warm up period on Solana is really fast. So it's like two days, um, one epoch basically. So even if you're like a big fund and you're trading, you would probably keep, you know, 80% of your soul staked and the, whatever you're using for trading unstaked, right? So then you're kind of experiencing minimum dilution or effectively like it's for whatever reason, 69% of the tokens are staked right now. If everyone staked exactly 69% of the tokens, <laughs> you'd be no dilution because mm -hmm. you effectively like, right? Like it's all right. moving from one bucket to the same to, to every person. So like, I think that that pain is actually like managed by people pretty effectively because the warm up and cool down period is so fast on Solana. So like, but like when I argue with you online, whether that like on Twitter, the posts are like, there's not enough room to like explain the nuance of that. Yeah. But like, you're not wrong that inflation is a thing and it is diluting some people, but how much I think there's a lot of nuance to figure out how much of that is. Uh, what I know is that like a clear cost to the network is the hardware. So like every validator, every RPC node, all of those have to be paid with real money, just like you pay for electricity to, to mine blocks. But like the difference between Bitcoin, the cost of hash power and the cost to run the Solana computer is like a million X, right? right. right? right, right. <laughs> so, uh, but like, I think for the network to be sustainable, the fees that you get from running it have to cover the total cost of the hardware. And I think like the fees right now are maybe like 50 million a year and the top cost of the hardware, depending on the provider and all that stuff is like maybe between 10 to 20. So I think the fees have passed the cost of the hardware so that you can say global, that it's sustainable. Global cost of maintaining the Solana network is 10 to $20 million. It depends how you count it, but like if yeah. you took the She's cheapest cheap. possible, if you took the cheapest possible, like no, 350 a month and you multiplied it by 3000 nodes, it actually comes out like to around 10. But mm -hmm. like people are not gonna take, there's lots of different other right. infra costs and no one, people will like pay for the more expensive ones, right? So you kind of like, maybe it's twice as much, but like, it's also a, bu a bunch of nuance there, right? Like, like RPC nodes that like Magic Eaton uses don't need to be paid for by the network because they have a business that makes money off the state and they will pay for those machines and count it as an expense. But it is providing some security to the state to have those replicas. So like how you count all this stuff is complicated. How you like attribute the earnings from Mav that Jito has is also complicated because effectively any any value that a block producer gets from the network incentivizes them to acquire more stake. Right. Right. So like that could be like all those incentives combined are like the positive stuff going into the network. All the costs are the negatives. I think right now the positives outweigh the negatives, but again, there's a bunch of nuance there. But I think like ultimately these networks have to capture a lot more value to be competitive to like profit per market cap with a tech company. If we have to actually like like compare those two things, unless you believe there's some other reason to value these things higher, I don't. I think ultimately like there's got to be like value created for the world is some <laughs> times risk-free asset price at the treasuries equals like our like total value of the system. I think that fundamental function works for everything. Mm -hmm. um, and like where that value capture occurs in the future, I think is if the network can handle many different hotspots, like thousands of them concurrently. And then the economic costs of those hotspots go up and like the kind of fees that you're seeing now on the network if you go to solana compass you see that like priority fees on the chart are now like the biggest thing <laughs> base fees you can't even see and vote fees are like barely like visible they're still visible but much much smaller portion so like in a world where solana is sustainable and is like valued and capturing value at a higher rate is a world where there is lots of hot spots you know, and the network can handle many concurrent hotspots at the same time. And those economics capture are captured by the protocol. Um, right. And by captured by the protocol, do you mean payment to validators or burn, sold burn? This is the big question is, I don't know if that matters. I don't like, I know a lot of folks in Ethereum want to do the burn, 
And there's good reasons for that. I don't know if it matters over the long term. This is like the big unknown. Sure. Like, I, I do, don't know if it matters. I will say that like all of the Ethereum people will like say, hey, do this, do this, do this. And it, it will be very much in line with like what Ethereum is. Like, why should you do the burn? Well, because Ethereum does the burn and, you know, yeah. we have ultrasound.money and we like to look at that website. But the thing is, like, if you keep on listening to the Ethereum people, they're just going to tell you to become Ethereum at the end of the day. And at some point, like, that's not helpful. Right. Um, right, like so, like the argument that the burn doesn't matter is that like uh, within the black box of the whole network, right? You have the negative externalities that you have to pay for to run the computers, all that stuff, and then you have the positive externalities where I like earned my paycheck from driving an Uber, and then I used it to pay for the fees on the network. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, but it doesn't matter if that fees burnt or is distributed to everyone in the box or like what happens in the box, how those numbers move around, do not change the weight of that box. <laughs> like it's, it's like digit, it's like accounting in the computer who cares if you burn it or not, or like whatever. I, I don't think it matters like at the end of the day. Um, I think it doesn't so matter like, at the end of the day to, to make the box function like the whether you give it to validators or you burn it like the box can function in both in both strategies but i mean like what you choose to do does change the output of the system right and so like the whole ethereum perspective is like you burn it because eth is money uh and the solana perspective is like you you want to minimize that because solana is like an applications platform uh and we want and it's all about well, i don't care about the burn of the token what i care about is that like the fees like don't spike without reason so like what breaks solana is that like because it's not a we don't have a layer two like layer twos are not on the roadmap like you can build layer twos in solana but the whole point of the single unified state machine is that you don't need them right. and if you have a single if you have like DeFi arbs increase the cost to access the network to the to have to outbid the the cost of the DeFi ARBs, it means that payments have to have a separate app chain. Right. It yeah, means yeah, yeah. like, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well then just make them all Celestia rollups or whatever. I don't mm -hmm. care. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, then like, it doesn't matter, right? Like, I think if you can't solve the economics, the isolation at the economics level, then the premise of Solana doesn't work. Um, but I don't, I think you need like some burn to prevent like weird spam attacks where validators like spam themselves and, and like for free mm -hmm. and can like price out users. A bunch of stuff with 1559 is actually really, really clever ways to prevent that. Right. Um, but I don't, I don't know if you need the burn for capturing value, like, cause the burn is very, very different from Apple getting dollars and hoarding those dollars that they can spend later at any given time to like build more products, right? Like Ethereum doesn't have that like dollar budget. When you burn the ETH, you cannot spend it in the future. <laughs> it's gone. Well, <laughs> that's that's not how I would if, describe it. I if would you say save like, the ETH, you would you can't it's pointless to save it or burn it. Like if you like convert it to dollars, that would be interesting and different. <laughs> <laughs> the the idea of the burn is that you burn the ether and then you give yourself tolerance to issue that ether again later. Right, and so in like turn in at a later date, you're diff you're in a totally different environment. And right. if a, if shit hits the fan mm -hmm. and everything is tanking, right, versus the dollar, you're not actually hedged to be able to issue more. You're like in a death spiral, and if you issue more, you die. Like if and the, the the question on Ethereum shouldn't be do we burn the ETH or do we give it to some validator or a public goods thing it should be do we convert it to dollars and keep this like other asset that is completely decoupled from ethereum in case shit hits the fan <laughs> yeah but you can't have that because these are like trustless economic systems Why that's not? like that's like well that's what like the terra uh, uh, foundation the, it, luna, the luna foundation got no. was like yeah we're gonna have like bitcoin and whenever we need to defend but, the peg we're gonna de uh, deploy no, the bitcoin you're not, the goal isn't to defend the peg the goal is to pay engineers to like yeah. make it better later well, That's so, a totally different thing. <laughs> you know, you know Kevin Owaki? <laughs> huh? Do you know Kevin Owaki? Uh, may, don't remember it, him. Uh, he's the founder of Gitcoin in, in the uh, Ethereum okay. ecosystem, and he made this like EIP proposal. This is like 
awesome, like really awesome Ethereum lore. He made this like Ethereum EIP proposal to like have 10% of block rewards go to fund like public goods. And like, how could you argue with that? Like we, we can, we all love public goods in Ethereum. Uh, but it actually like created like a pretty big, it, it, not, not like civil war. Cause like one side very, one very, very quickly, but it was all about like the credible neutrality of like where we send the ether that's captured. And the idea is like, if we send it to Gitcoin, well then, you know, Gitcoin today wants to fund public goods, but what happens when like, if Gitcoin just becomes like a vector for control? Change it. Yeah, but then you're changing we, too much, have, right? Like you can- No, you need we to, built, we, we have cryptography, which is the tool that the rest of the world, 10 billion people are mm -hmm. going to use to coordinate decisions much more difficult than where, where the burn goes. This I is like the magic. It, you, you guys it's like are a too pessimistic. Thing, right? no, you're, you're, no, it's like, it, this, <laughs> this is like the whole like uh, cockroach chain uh, file of Gadriel is the metaphor that yeah. Vitalik uses, which is like, yo, you don't mess with that because as soon as like you just solve that by changing it again in the future, all of a sudden you have like a political and governance system. But, but the whole point of like cryptography, right? What we're building is fundamentally is to connect... 10 billion people right so they can all coordinate decisions instantly globally and like do much more like powerful things than like funding open source software yeah i this think is there like is maybe there an is opportunity value for un governance yeah. though so like there is like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah we can all we can find systems yeah. that are totally resonant with every single human but like what, what's that one line is like democracy is the worst form of governance except for all the other ones oh, yeah, it's like agreed. one of the yeah, best yeah. forms of governance <laughs> is like not having any governance and so like that, that's I, the Ethereum perspective is like, you don't mess with the block rewards because that becomes a vector for political capture. I don't disagree. And I would not recommend anyone try this on Solana because I think it's, too, <laughs> it's way too complicated too. But like, I think it's a missed opportunity, I think. Okay, I so like, I think this is like one of the big uh, dichotomies between like the Ethereum perspective and the Solana perspective. And I would actually like camp and Ethereum. And I don't speak for all of Solana. This is sure. just my opinion of too, right? Of like, course. I actually think on this part of the spectrum, like Ethereum and Bitcoin are actually closer together than Ethereum is, is to Solana, where like money is an app. And it's honestly like one of the most important yeah. apps. So this is part of like the bankless thesis that but, we've been like pounding around for a while, where like, we in crypto are here to make new monies. And so like the Solana idea of, um, do you have non-stake- I actually would disagree. I, I think Solana folks very much in the same camp. Uh, there was this like, again, people started talking about like forking off the FTX estate and it was mm. like quickly squashed by everyone. Right. There was like a yeah. instant immune response that like property rights are right. sacred. Right. Whatever happens, happens. Like the state, the sacrosanct, and we do whatever we can to preserve it. And that right. wasn't, it didn't come from me. I like, right. it literally came from the ecosystem. So right. I think, I don't think it would be possible for Solana to do this either. And I feel like it's a missed opportunity for somebody to think bigger and be like, the world is like very complex. What we're building is actually to like empower people to do very, very complex governance stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, we can do it. It's just going to be hard and we can figure it out. But like, so I get, most I get people that, like, just want to be like, back believes off in and... property rights because that's like a core tenant of crypto. If you don't have property rights in your block space, then yeah. what is your blockchain even for? Um, but I don't see the same area of emphasis from the Solana community as being interested in like money and the concept of money and its role in the world. Um, That I think is like, maybe a very nuanced way to look at it but like i don't think i think that the idea of like collecting the fees and then spending them is against at least to me rubs against my idea of like property rights like it feels like i'm being taxed mm. and then somebody else benefits right like it's <laughs> like uh collecting the fees and right. then spending them or, or spending them on on like arbitrary governance decided things doesn't feel true to like being a fully crazy property rights libertarian, which we all yeah, get wait, to. Yeah, wait, wait. So I would agree past. with that. So like uh, Ethereum, Ether collecting fees and then burning it, and rather than dis deciding yeah. that like this public institution is better than that public institution, 
feels good in terms of like no one's no one no one's rights are being violated because everyone's being treated equally correct and i feel like most of the solana community would agree with that sentiment Mm -hmm. like we all like to larp as libertarians right Right. (laughs) but i think like reality is that like there's far more complex things in the world and like you want to solve them and like i think cryptography offers like a way to like really transform governance and do all these things that we all dream about in the post crypto world and like if we are too afraid to do them ourselves there's no way the world is going to do it Hmm. so like at the same time like while i like agree hey text don't like don't do this but like i wish somebody would do it do you <laughs> Maybe cosmos think, cosmos people will do it i don't know are you like advocating this as like a thought experiment as like a, this is worth thinking about or do you actually think like we could make a system of money that has governance as a component of it i think if we did it would be far more powerful than one without it that's very uh very keynesian of you yeah i think like human intelligence i'm like very optimistic on human intelligence human goodness their ability to like given enough communication come to the right decision i'm very optimistic on that i think it's a very hard problem to solve and like i wish somebody was solving it but it would be a first i would say for humanity to solve that problem no, I think we've done it like to human, some extent. human governance over money and 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 like, governance is like the meta problem of like the human yeah. species, right? Like the world's like US is not too terrible, right? Like most of the places that we choose to live is pretty have pretty decent governance. There's definitely places that don't, but like mm-hmm. out of a lot of trial and error, people have figured out like most of the best practices. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is what I was going to bring up with the whole, like, I think the Ethereum, again, you don't speak for Solana, you are one member of the Solana, perhaps a very important one, but a member nonetheless. Uh, this is where, like, if that if that is, like, an, a perspective to to apply to, like, and I do see this in, like, broader Solanas, like, they they don't emphasize the role and importance of money in the same way that Bitcoin exclusively yep. does, and a large part of Ethereum definitely does. Yep. And because, like, the last time we had you on Bankless, like, we asked you, like, is soul yeah, money? Yeah. And you're like, soul, soul's not money. And to us, I'm like, so that's, that's the thing. We start there and we expand yeah. outwards. But without your base chain becoming money, then you don't have, you can't expand outwards from yeah. that. Yeah, so that I agree with you. I don't think it matters to Solana devs or community if like if all the volume that was happening on there was going against the wrapped ETH pair, everyone mm-hmm. would be just as happy. You're like, holy shit, we got it to work. Everything's like working. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if, if ETH was the unit of account in Solana, you think Solana can be like, nice, cool, great. Yeah, because like the message bus works. It's coordinating state. Everyone is like paying very low low cheap fees and everything's working <laughs> look as an eth maxi i would love eth to be the unit of account inside of solana that would be awesome whatever like who cares like it, it's like no different than usdc it's not like i'm like competing with jeremy allaire and like money adoption i want to help him <laughs> is that right? is, is this a minority or majority opinion would you say of the solana community Ooh, that's a good question I don't know. This is a good question. I think like people are become token maxis because a lot of the like faith and like kind of all these things and what this technology can accomplish in the future are all wrapped into this like mm-hmm. one thing. And then like it becomes like I think it's harder to build an NFT marketplace for like whatever quacks that right. would trade against USDC versus one was sold because you're trying to attract the super Solana maxis that are, that are all like, you have that, like, I, and this is where I think the money meme starts to roll is that right. like, once you start building other functions on top and your initial c- customer base is like all the maxis of that particular, like L1, they're all going to use that token. But like, I don't fundamentally believe that there's anything I can do like as an engineer or programmer to make that happen. It's a meme. Sure. And like, right. I think like, I honestly think that if ETH was the biggest trading pair, like the whole idea of like Solana's blockchain and NASDAQ speed, that would be the narrative and meme. Nobody's going to talk about soul as money and nobody does. Right. I don't think you see that sentiment on crypto Twitter or soul as money. So like, Mm -hmm. I don't think much would change in the community if, if that was like, was the result. 
which is Look, cool. I, I think if like I there think- was <laughs> more if ETH if ETH was like the unit of account inside Solana, and like when I went to like uh, Tensor to go like buy another Mad Lad, and it was denominated in ETH, that would be like the greatest Ethereum Solana handshake moment of like all time. <laughs> They could literally do that and do the trade exchange through Jupiter for zero fees. <laughs> <laughs> like, you wouldn't What's know the fastest what way to get ETH on Solana these days? Is it Wormhole? It's it's probably Mayan Bridge is like a wrapper on top of Wormhole that has nice UX. Or like, I think Jupiter probably has a, a kind of a, a bridge wrapper too. Cool. All right. As soon as I see a marketplace with ETH denomination, boy is going to go well, shopping. Okay. Yeah. Somebody should like, oh man, I'll, I'll ask the Tensor guys if they can detect if you have MetaMask installed. And oh, they can re-denominate to ETH? <laughs> yeah. Re-denominate an ETH. <laughs> check, uh, check how much MetaMask you have, like how much ETH you have and like pass a certain threshold, you re-dominate. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, we do have the Tensor guys on in uh, January in three weeks, so maybe I'll just ask them then. Anatoly, uh, when we hang up this phone and uh, it's 2 p.m. on Tuesday, December 19th, and what are you going to go do inside of Solana? What, is, what are you going to go work on first? I'm writing docs, alignment docs. That sounds awful, <laughs> to be honest. That's actually great. I'm writing, writing like alignment architecture- docs actually kind of makes it seem like you're doing some of the stuff that Vitalik does when he writes on Vitalik.ca, which is just like broad vision, broad vibes, everyone else go implement it kind of strategy. It's more specific than that. I'm okay. like, this is the final state of these specific implementation components. Mm-hmm. And this is how like they should look like. And I think this is the effect that it'll have. And it's not to say that like that's the final state, but at least I'm giving people like a North Star and a reasoning behind it. And they're super smart engineers. What's great is that they will hear me out. They they will not listen right. to me just simply because I said something. Mm-hmm. So like that forces that discussion and like people will like comment and like so these are like kind of like what a solana like the final state looks like um kind of stuff and you can go and read all this on like soul linked uh which is like this one dev built me like a little web platform where i can charge people usdc i use usdc as money to access my email and my blog (laughs) (laughs) oh gosh (laughs) <laughs> oh, should I should I have it? I'll ask him to add ETH. I will. I will yeah, it's just it's like it's not it's not very cypherpunk of you to have USDC. I'm sorry. It's just this is the way that it I is. I will use. Yeah, I will have access to my block and wormhole wrapped ETH on Solana. <laughs> <laughs> Anatoly, this has been great. Um, one last question for you. Uh, how? Let's see. If there's one thing about Solana that you would find is like misrepresented the most by dumb Ethereum podcasters, um, what would it be? Um, actually, things have gotten a lot better. I think like the criticisms. <laughs> Wait, about misrepresented misrepresentation or dumb Ethereum podcasters? Both. Uh, I mean, like first of all, I think most folks in the space are actually not as dumb. Uh, like. There, there's really awesome people in the space, right? Like, and I think what's what's get, gotten better, and this is the, like the Ethereum immune response, is that like people will initially reject everything, just like Bitcoin people, but then they're smart and curious. And then like you stick around long enough and you kind of tell your story and everyone's like, oh, you got something interesting there. And then like you start getting this exchange of ideas going. Um, and I think... Um, it's the criticisms have gotten way better in the sense that they're like, yeah, we need to fix the stuff. And like, there's a plan to fix it. Cool. Well, Anatoly, thanks for coming on Bankless today. I appreciate it, my man. For sure. Thank you. Bankless Nation, you know the deal. Crypto is risky. Ethereum is risky. Solana is risky. Tech stacks of this nature, they're all risky. You can lose what you put in. We are headed west. This is a frontier. It's not for everyone, but we are glad you are with us on the Bankless journey. Thanks a lot. 